Okay, we are live with Jeremy Krell of Rever Partners, hotly anticipated Facebook Live that I certainly have been looking forward to for quite some time because we're going to be talking tonight about this exciting new opportunity, which is venture capital in the dental world. Well, the dent specifically in the dental sphere, there's been dent venture capital for the dental world, but it hasn't been done to this level of refinement. And that's why I'm extremely excited to hear what Jeremy has to say tonight. I'm looking forward to learning a lot, as is everybody else. And also, to top it all off, it's unprecedented in the UK as well. Jer Jeremy is, of course, based in America. And now is the time to cross the pond and open up this whole new dimension of possibilities for dental tech startups. Jeremy, how are you, my friend? Hey, James. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Uh, do doing well and... Um, maybe by, uh, by introduction, uh, I'm a general dentist, like many of you uh, and those in the community. Um, I have really spent the majority of my career, uh, even though I've, I've been in clinical dentistry for a decade, I've really spent the majority of my career in um, what we call really the startup world uh, or entrepreneurship in general, uh, where I've been for about 18 years. First, I started in uh, tech, then um, oral, then health tech, now oral tech. Uh, and so some of my past companies you may or may not have heard of being across the pond, but Oscar Health Insurance, which I PO'd about 16 months ago, uh, as well as Quip, uh, the subscription electric toothbrush oral health product company um, founded by a, a, a British uh, co-founder uh, as well there. Uh, and then I've spent my time sort of building out first uh, a boutique consulting firm um, slash family office, and now Revere Partners, which is really the first and only venture capital fund that's exclusively focused on, on dental technology uh, and globally, globally in both, both our investors and, and investments. So really happy to be here. That's awesome, man. And you, of course, are a dentist yourself, but you've got a history of starting companies that have done extremely well. Can you delve into that a little bit more? Because that was something that really impressed me whenever we spoke well, when, when I was over in the States to see you recently and prior to that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And look, some of it is sheer dumb luck and some of it is is good people and, and, and some of it is, you know, listening and leading. But I started in technology. Um, really a, a web and graphic design company that I, I uh, co-founded with a best friend. Uh, we spun two companies off uh, and, and sold them to major, uh, major CPG players um, from there because that felt really good. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of like a, a bit of a business high, if you will. Um, we went, I went to a luxury good and commodity service targeting college students. Uh, we scaled it up. I was the chief director of sales, uh, ultimately the chief operating officer before selling the company four years later. Um, and that was right before the 2008 market crash, right? So kind of escaping by the skin of our teeth, if you will. Very, very lucky um, to have kind of sold that company before anybody really realized what 2008 had to had to bear. Um, and then, you know, kind of went into development mode. Um, you know, during the, the financial crisis, thinking about, you know, how could I do what I had done previously on a larger scale? And so started a, uh, an incubator in Boston, together to New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Um, we were kind of industry agnostic and would help startups with three things, kind of lean startup methodology, recruitment and retention of talent. Uh, you know, secondly, recruiting funds. We were not a fund ourselves. And then lastly, you know, some of the otherwise time consuming or expensive services like web and graphic design that would help them get off the ground. And so I ran that incubator for five years and loved working with all the new products and services uh, before I stepped down to sit on the on the board. Um, and that's when I accepted a leadership role at Oscar Health Insurance, uh, leading a department there called Strategic Provider Innovations and Development. And we were focused on some hospital, major hospital um, partner management and, and health enterprise system management some technology integrations and some special internal projects uh, around federal risk adjustment and virtual teledocs and et cetera. So very forward thinking, data driven company with a lot of really smart people involved and so much to learn. Um, after my time at Oscar, then I went to Quip, which is that subscription electric toothbrush oral health product company. It was kind of my first um, 
you know, major foray into dental technology and, and dental innovation. And, you know, it caught me by surprise even though I came to the company so early, you know, roughly 10 employees or less and a Kickstarter campaign and an Instagram ad and a very small office. Um, you know, there was really from the beginning, this desire to grow and scale a business that would go from product to education to all these professional services. And it was really a takeover dentistry, you know, model from the very small fry seat that we took uh, initially. Um, but it did, it's grown tremendously. And um, they've raised uh, a couple hundred million um, in, in, uh, in financing and uh, 15 million subscribed users. And uh, it's really been a great growth story. So I stayed there and scaled up the professional services side of the organization for about four and a half years. And then finally got into into the, the dark side of the world, the investing, uh, the investing side, if you will. Um, and that's that's where I am now. I'm stuck here because I, I love getting involved with multiple different companies uh, and helping them through their their, uh, you know, earlier and and series A kind of growth stages. Hats off to you because it sounds like you have a flipping unbelievable work ethic. That's for sure um yeah especially to and I, I know that you've exited quite a few of those companies at opportune moments and then that's what's led you those experiences has led you to create what you have done now which is revere capital partners maybe it might be nice to talk a little bit more about that yeah so you know look it's, it's interesting there dentistry is a space that has so much innovation that goes on uh, a lot of people inclusive of, of in the industry us as dentists we're very you know, inventive. We're sort of, you've probably heard of that part doctor, part engineer, part artist, that acronym for dentist. Um, and I think it, it kind of rings true. It's also a space that's lagged behind other spaces for a long time in terms of technology innovation. So it's really ripe in terms of turning over some of the old models and materials and techniques. And, and so that's really a ripe ground for, for inventors. Um, the problem was it's very hindered by capital. So we wanted to create a, um, a venture structure that would support uh, early stage technology startups, not just the practice side of the industry, right? We kind of started by dentists for dentists with the notion of how do I own what's in the practice, not just the four walls of the practice itself, right? So we have a couple of kind of key things to this uh, where we kind of co-founded a, a unique fund structure. So the first part of it is that we, you know, that basically we will, work like a subscription, we have a payment model. So you don't, you can invest upfront, you know, if that's what you prefer, or you can invest over, you know, kind of a quarterly payment structure. So you get to stay more liquid over time if that's better for your financial situation. So that was, that was really important to us. The second thing for, from the investor perspective was the diversification. We wanted to, there's so much demand here. Uh, we wanted to invest in three to five companies, you know, per quarter. And so we've done that investing in 22 to date uh, since we were publicly launched, which is the beginning of 2021. Uh, we were in operations for 18 months prior to that. So we're about three years old now. Um, beyond the diversification, we wanted a, a, a structure that would allow us to market the fund, which we are able to do. Uh, we wanted a structure that would remain open-ended uh, and allow us to continue to raise capital into the fund without shutting it off, closing the fund. Uh, this way, as more people learn about it, like yourselves who want to invest, they, they can, it's open to investment. Uh, and so it was really kind of crucial that we land on this structure to do it. Today, we have between about uh, 480 and 500 companies in the pipeline uh, across our data stack, our tech stack, and our team of 75 people. That puts about 125 to 150 in active diligence at any time. Um, and as I mentioned, we uh, we invest in three to five a quarter. We've invested in 22 uh, and uh, and one's been acquired already and three are in acquisition conversation. So quite a bit of movement. We put the, we're very strategic investors. So we put this ecosystem of support services around any of the startups that we invest in some 20, 25 support services. And we have a whole corporate services arm of our team, too, where we're serving kind of more organized dentistry, the big manufacturers, distributors, insurers, DSOs etc cetera, etc cetera, because they're also looking for how do we source deals how do we diligence deals how do we deploy capital in an agile capacity how do we support those investments and so we've really kind of put ourselves at the intersection of 
um, uh, you know, the dental assets that are looking to raise capital and dental investors that are looking to put a dollar on some or a variety of dental investments. That's awesome. Let's break it down real to a real, real fundamental level for those out there who are listening and they're unsure of a few of the terms that were in there. DSOs, what does that stand for? Yeah, dental support organization. These are the chains of dental offices, uh, which may be called different things in different countries, but uh, basically a, a, a chain, a multi, multi-location multi practice. I see. I see. A That's awesome. Franchise-like model, if you will. I hope you don't mind me looking at my phone while we're doing this, by the way. I'm just engaging with people in the comments. No, it's nothing, amazing. Nothing personal, Jeremy. Nothing personal. Just in case you were wondering yeah. why my eyes keep getting a little bit sidetracked. I, I always feel like I have to explain that when I'm talking to the guests. They don't think I'm being rude. But anyway, I've said it now. So, yes, DSOs. I don't know if that's more of an American term, as it because it's not something I've ever come across uh, on over here. But maybe that's just me. Uh, yes, yeah, so here, I mean, they, you know, it, it, maybe it is. It's a way that you can file um, your practices, you register your practices as a DSO. It's also, you know, important because their corporate structure is one where they don't just have the professional corporations, you know, the the business that their doctors own but they have a management company that sits on top and that anybody can own a piece of the management company, even a non dentist. It's also important just based on how they operate. They, you know, DSO is a bit of a spectrum in terms of how they do their day-to-day -day business, meaning some of them will centralize branding, some not, some will centralize procurement, some not, some will centralize technology decisions and deployment, some not, right? This is really important for the, you know, it tends to be in most dental markets, really important for the, startups because they like to grow within this environment you can make one enterprise sale to a multi-location practice and get a good chunk of revenue you get a lot of feedback a lot of validation so it's it's really good to to grow there we're currently us is currently around has about 150,000 dental practices it's about 22 percent consolidated into these dso's uh, and estimates are you know within five years at 30 uh, percent may, maybe even sooner uh, so it's a massively growing trend in the United States to consolidate these practices into a, a bigger group. We, we have a name for that, actually. We call them corporates over here. So it sounds like a like for like thing, really just different terminology. Interesting. We've got some people commenting that they have startups and they're all ears listening to this conversation. And that's an important thing that you should touch upon, Jeremy, which you've, which you've already mentioned. This is not just us speaking about you from the point of view that you'd like dentists to invest in Revere and hence grant it more liquidity. It's actually us extending the arm to anybody out there who has any sort of startup centered around the dental world. But we'll come on to that in just two minutes in more detail. Piotr, I see you in the comments there, my friend. It sounds like Piotr is a candidate for this uh, by the looks of it, according to what he said. Uh, about his software company, and we'll come on to that in just two minutes. Why do you think that there is a funding gap or a gap in the market for these sorts of companies, which you're now addressing? Yeah, you know, I, it takes a lot. It takes one to know one is kind of the short answer, right? This is a niche space. You can do really well in this space in a lot of ways from working in a corporate, you know, manufacturer, distributor insurance, or your version of corporate practices, right? Um, or, uh, you know, as a dentist, you can, you can do really well, uh, or, or as a startup, but you have to know the space, right? And, and for most investors, you know, they, they don't, they simply do not, you know, especially institutional investors, venture capitalists, and, uh, you know, other structured funds, they simply do not have the data to know the space. So actually, one of the first things we did in our first 18 months of operations was gather the data on now roughly about 700 companies and their, you know, their funding history, how, you know, what dates did they raise? How much did they raise? How much did they change in value and tagging that by the type of company and the stage of fundraising, right? So that we could track these changes in value over time by different company types and, and rounds. And that really helped us to understand the space and how to operate in it. We've also been operators, myself and our general partner and CFO, we've been operators of dental startups before. 
right? So it's it's just, it's really tough to operate in a space that you don't know. For anybody who thinks or says that the dental space is too small from an investment perspective, that, that, that right there just validates the lack of knowledge, right? Just in the United States, there's about 180 billion US dollars spent on the provision of dental care. That's just the rendering of dental services, right? It doesn't count all the product markets around dental, right? Toothpaste or toothbrushes or, you know, uh, scanning, intraoral scanning software or AI, right? It doesn't, it doesn't include any of that, right? So this is, this is not, you know, from the perspective of somebody who's in the space, knows the space, has the data on the space, um, you know, it, it, it is known. If you have a, other investors trying to mark to mark you to other, you know, comparables. So if they're trying to say, well, you're an AI company and we expect our other AI companies to perform like this, right? Or you're a fintech company and we expect our other fintech companies to perform like this. Why is it different in dental, right? That just shows they, they don't know the space or the industry, right? So I think that's the big, the big, the big funding gap is really a big knowledge gap. Is this, are you the first venture capital firm in the dental world or are there others? We are the first venture cap independent venture capital fund. So when I say independent, I mean, we are not associated with any other corporation. Uh, and the and the first venture capital fund that is dedicated to dental technology, right? There are definitely private equity funds, for example, that invest in dental practices, which we do not do from this fund. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, we, we are also global in both our investors and investments. So really there's three firsts in there. First to be independent uh, VC fund, first to be a dedicated to dental technology and first to be global. That's awesome. Interesting stuff. Anybody out there in the audience who has a dental tech startup, Jeremy is the person that you want to talk to. And we have something interesting along those lines that we'll be announcing before this podcast is over. Of course, an exciting, an exciting event that'll be occurring on Dentists Who Invest for all you would-be entrepreneurs out there. All Not just the would-be entrepreneurs, but the entrepreneurs who are out there and doing it, but want to scale as well. Jeremy, so... As we say, you're obviously you represent venture capital in the dental in the dental world. What is the most exciting things that you've seen that are coming up in the dental sphere? Obviously, without spilling any beans and anything that we shouldn't, of course. But uh, as much as you can say, things to look forward to. Yeah, some really cool innovations coming down the pipeline. Of course, um, you know, I think one of them, one of the areas that gets talked a lot about is AI. Uh, most people talk about object or, you know, or image recognition. There's all kinds of AI being applied, which I think is super exciting. Uh, there are new intraoral scanning devices that even allow the patient to do it or the provider to do it, but much quicker and still at very high um, acuity and, and accuracy. Uh, there are uh, microbiome companies that are looking at what are the bad bacteria in your mouth and, and how do we educate people about those and what, what can we do to treat them? Um, so those, those are really exciting orthodonture and different ways to allow general practitioners to treat complex cases, um, 3d printing of bone scaffolding robots that cut teeth and place implants by themselves. I mean, there is a, a repertoire of, um, of new innovations coming down, down the pipeline. Now, it, since we've seen hundreds of these, it takes, you know, it takes a bit to, to catch me by surprise, but Every now and then, you know, you walk down and read, uh, you know, your emails and you find that there are now nanobots that can, uh, you know, help to clear the plaque on your teeth, right? So it, there really is, there really is something for, for everyone there, really cutting edge future of dentistry stuff. That is so cool. You know, honestly, right? Call me, maybe it's just a sign of me getting old, but we're actually at that point now where science fiction is becoming real, or at least it appears to be anyway, conventional science fiction that we were raised on, or at least exposed to via pop culture during growing up. Like I remember watching iRobot and there was a scene where he talked to his speaker to turn it off. And I remember being blown away and that happened like five flipping years ago, you know? So it just, it, it you know, it's, it's, Technology grows exponentially. We've got Moore's law and what have you, the premise that everything, the, the smartest computers in the world double in power every 18 months. And what do we know as soon as something doubles, it grows exponentially as well. And it's obviously the dental space is no exception for that. 
there'll be some would-be entrepreneurs in the audience tonight. What are you looking for from these individuals for them to make themselves invest worthy for Revere? Yeah, and look, but you know, bear in mind with anything that I say here, you can't go back and change change anything in the past, right? You can only only have control over the future. But there are a variety of things that certainly help. Um, you know, first, do do you have something that's groundbreaking, right? Uh, is your product or your service is it is it really going to change the way that you know dentistry is practiced or the provider experience or the patient experience or health outcomes? Is it going to make those significantly better, right? And really serve the value chain. Um, I, another one is more from the people perspective, right? Um, how are you in terms of your interpersonal skills, your team working skills, your leadership skills, right? Does your background warrant what you're saying that you can do or that your team is going to do in terms of, of founding this company and running this company? Uh, are you coachable, right? Can you take feedback? That's uh, huge. I, That's I huge, by the way. After one. Uh, we get on calls. Sometimes we give feedback, which not a lot of you know VCs necessarily do. Um, and when that is met with resistance um, or defensiveness, uh, you know that that is yeah, that is not necessarily taken well uh, on on the investor side. Uh, so that's that's kind of another um, another thing to kind of think about. Um, and then uh, you know. There, there's there's much more to it is your market size. Are you thinking about your market size reasonably, right? Your TAM, your SAM, your SOM, are you are you identifying who you need to be targeting right now at this stage? Uh, is is that there? Um, so I think those are some of the, the key elements that we look for right up front. I think the EQ thing is massive in business and still somehow underrated. You can have the best product in the world, but if you have no people skills, you're never going to be able to get yourself out there and promo it. It's actually a huge thing. In fact, if anything, it takes precedent. Obviously, yeah. there has to be some level of technical worthiness, I suppose, in whatever you've created effectively. But the soft skills are the new hard skills. I don't even know if that's a revelation for most people listening, but it certainly was something that struck me through going through this whole entrepreneurial journey. The greatest CEOs are the people with the greatest EQ. Who are the most the most in touch with reality? Big time. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and look, these are the life. Our venture having great investors and excellent um, startups is are the lifeblood of any fund, right? Um, so you, you know, we're inviting these people not only to our portfolio but to our team. So we really want to see that um, you know you're you're after it, that you know your 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 strengths, that you're aware of your weaknesses and. Uh, you know, you're able to mitigate those weaknesses and push harder on the strengths when you need to. Uh, I think that's that's critical. Not every no one per takes a village, right? No one person can run an entire startup. So, you know, if you're more the clinical side or the you know technical side or the science side, well, think about who's going to run the business side, right? Uh, it's not an ego thing, right? It, you know, as as we like to say at the fund, no ego amigo, right? It's it's you need to have friends. To run the to run the entire business, right? There need to be, you know, people on the you know management and leadership team, people on the finance team, operations, marketing, right? No startup has all these positions from the start, but you, you do need to have a plan for this. You do need to be open to, um, you know, the influence of other people. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. And you know what? So here's something that I was ruminating over before we came on this live, and I was thinking, you know. What an interesting space to invest in because you've got all these people and the majority of these people who are creating these startups will be dentists. Now, what, let's break down what a dentist is. A dentist is someone who's had the perseverance and dedication to push themselves to the pinnacle of education by flipping default, right? By flipping, as soon as you hear the, as soon as you know that they're a dentist, as soon as you hear that they're a dentist, you already know that they've got this level of grit and determination and steeliness and intelligence that's afforded to i'm gonna i don't know i don't have any hard numbers but let's say one one percent of the population 0.5 yeah and now your people you're picking the people within that who have the who have the entrepreneurial flair and intelligence as well and all i'm gonna say is that those things lend themselves into each other they go hand in hand and what i mean by that is because those people already have those attributes already, a lot of them will have 
the determination required to be an entrepreneur. And I, 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 it would be interesting. I don't know how we're ever going to get these statistics to know how many per head, per head entrepreneurs we have per dentist for, for us as dentists within the dental profession versus per head in the general population. Maybe I'm just talking absolute nonsense and maybe it's exactly the same. But all I'm going to say is it lends into itself, doesn't it? There must be something in there. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. It's no coincidence that spark that happens at the beginning of a startup. It's people working really well together on something that they mutually enjoy. And that's what does it. Let's offer some advice to the startups in the audience and the people who are thinking about starting their own business, people who have that entrepreneurial fire and start inside of them, but they just don't know where to start or they get imposter syndrome or they think the only thing that they know is dentistry. What would you say to those people? First of all, you got to go for it, right? If you think that there's a real problem uh, and that you have a solution to it, that's the time to act, right? You might've wished that that came when you were at the beginning of your career and you know, you didn't have much to lose. It didn't, it came now, or maybe it did. And you are at the beginning of your career, right? But it, the, the idea, the problem, it, it, the solution, it comes when it comes, right? So you have to kind of get after it and, you know, realizing fully that that can be scary, especially for people who have worked so hard to get a dental degree, work so hard to practice the profession for so long, build up your patient roster and the, the trust among your, your patients and your community. And uh, I, I, we fully, you know, understand how hard it is to then split your time or even step away from, you know, doing something that you used to do habitually uh, or a profession that you've used to practice. Right. But, you know, you're never going to know what the startup can turn into unless you pursue it. Right. Uh, it doesn't, you know, only for a, a very transient period of time, can you really do it part time? Right. A lot of failure results just from, you know, kind of doing it, but barely. Right. So I think that's one part of it. I think another, you know, kind of key piece or key almost pitfall that I see with a lot of startups is you have to share, right? There's no, in order to get yourself further, you have to be willing to share what you're working on and, and look for help and people that can help you. You know, people that think that they can't share until a patent was filed, can't share until an NDA is signed. You stand to lose a lot more than you stand to gain. Yeah, there are some copycats out there, but you have to be confident in your own ability to execute that you are either further ahead of them or that they could never execute the vision you have in your mind, right? You need to have that conviction going into it. I'm not saying share every bit of the source code or, you know, the entire product development plan and all of its specs. I'm not saying that, right? But you do need to share, you need to give a little bit to get and you stand to gain a lot, right? So those are two of the kind of key early, you know, pieces of advice I would give other startups. You know what? So through doing what I do in Dentistry Invest and the Reignite Circle, which I'm involved in as well, which a few people know me from who are listening, it's effectively a business coaching circle for people who haven't heard about it. And you keep, I keep seeing the same things come up and everybody hits the same hurdles. Biggest ones, imposter syndrome, I got to say, is up there. The one that you said about not sharing that's got to be up there too. Like we're indoctrinated to think that we have to have some sort of legal document in order to do well, in order to disclose what we're, we're proposing and, and not just that, just with flipping everything. People are so obsessed with getting documents and signing agreements and contracts and what have you. If someone really does not like you and does want to get you, it doesn't matter what a contract says, they'll find a way. So the actual best way to avoid all of that, is just to be nice as hell to absolutely everyone, at least in my experience anyway. And the thing about it is, if you are actually like that, it won't be inauthentic anyway. You just got to be real, you know? And people people will, will people will buy from you because you're a person that they can relate to. That's actually your greatest strength is your uniqueness. And I just wanted to touch upon one thing that you said just there, which was just like what you were saying a minute ago, people feel like if someone beats them that that's because they've disclosed too much information about what they do i would actually flip that on its head and i would say listen if anybody beats me in this game in whatever i do i actually see that as a reflection on me and the fact that i need to improve i'm looking here not here if that occurs because what it means is that there's something that i didn't do right there's something that i could be much better at there's something that I could have improved upon. 
And that for me is the lesson or the gift when something like that occurs. It's just a mindset flip. And if anything, it's an opportunity to learn and push yourself further. Yeah, absolutely. Way of looking at it. It's on you. It's a, it's an early startup. It isn't going to build itself. You got to do it. <laughs> yeah. And you know what, you know what, another thing that you said, and I, get, I love this stuff, like this stuff gives me energy big time when I'm on these, when I'm on those coaching calls and when I'm doing this effectively, because we're just talking about the same thing. One of the greatest things is fear. That's the, what's one of the biggest things that holds people back. It's this fear that once upon a time served us back when we used to be cavemen and cave women. Okay. Now this is going to get a little bit abstract, but bear with me. All right. Once upon a time we lived, when we lived in caves, the thing that kept us in the cave so we didn't venture outside when we didn't need to was fear. But the difference was back then, if we went outside, we'd get eaten by a wild animal. Something bad would happen. Are you with me? Yeah. With so you. If effectively, effectively, the people that did do that, the people that did push those boundaries were removed from the flipping gene pool. Okay. Now, right, we don't have to worry about that when we walk out our front door or, some, or pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone or doing something that may not necessarily be accepted by our peers it doesn't have the same level of importance as it did when we lived these very secluded tribal lifestyles whereas nowadays that's actually the thing that people are, are seeking to avoid sometimes that's the fear it's the fear of rejection of those around them what if it doesn't work out what if people laugh at me what if this this x y and z happens you know that's that's how that fear doesn't serve you anymore but it's actually this ancient instinct that still resides in our heads and that for me is how i at least perceive that in other people when i see it and listen we all get it i get it everybody gets it from some time to time but that for me is how i've reconciled that or understood it that's how i perceive it that's then guess what? You now have the perspective and self-awareness to understand that it actually is that fear that doesn't serve you anymore. And you know what? Even if it's not true, it's still a theory that works that allows you to push yourself. Anyway, like I said, we're getting a little abstract there, but I do I do absolutely, absolutely, absolutely love this stuff. We've got some questions coming in. We have Facebook user. How many active users, tech startup companies would should have? Let me just construct this sentence here because it's a bit jumbled. How many active users tech startup should a tech startup company have before approaching venture capital firms i believe that's what the question is trying to say yeah so you know look there there isn't we get this question a lot there isn't necessarily a hard number every startup is so different it's product or it's service we are attracted to traction right naturally speaking uh, you know when when you're showing us that there's demand for this thing that you've done or that you've built you know, we want to know more about it. So that could come in the form of, you know, user engagement, number of users, how actively they're using it, how they're increasing their usage of it uh, or consumption of it, right? It could come in dollars, dollars of, of revenue, growth of revenue, month over month, year over year, right? Uh, there are a lot of different metrics that can, you know, effectively show, um, you, you know, traction isn't there isn't a specific dollar uh you know look some venture capital funds will even look pre c pre revenue if, if they're going to do that and that's that's more and more rare these days especially the way the market is but if they're going to do that uh you know you, you should confirm that before you get on the call to avoid yourself and them being frustrated but other than that um you know if you think that you can show you know improvement over one month to the next one month to the next for the past three months at least and you you know strong reason to believe it's only going to increase the month after i think that's probably a good guideline to go by so this question vaguely came up between you and i beforehand although not quite in the same format but something similar and i was saying to you listen jeremy when these people approach me on the group is there any such thing as too early to be seeking venture capital and the way that you phrased it stuck with me a little bit because you said listen as long as it's a, maybe a tier above a, a an idea jotted on a napkin then it's good you know it's worth a conversation because here's the thing even if it's not like you know we're gonna jump in and invest in them tomorrow it's a, it's a conversation starter and as it's a process it's an evolution it's a journey maybe now is not the time but because we've had the introduction today further down the line it's a door that's open 
potentially anyway. So yeah, it's no, it's it's a good question though. Uh, Mark Warren has contributed something, and I'm not sure. I'm I don't know if this is the first time you've heard this joke, but I think it's mildly witty. If not, surely you mean denture capital. <laughs> yeah, we have we get a lot of uh, a lot of different words thrown out there. Den tech, oral tech. Um, I don't know that I've, I've heard denture capital, but I'll take it. Um, yeah, oh, you, no. so is that original for you or not? Because I thought to myself, that's not going to be the first time Jeremy's heard No, it. I think that's actually the first time I've heard it articulated. It's, okay, denture hats capital. off. So, okay. so I'll, I'll take that one as original. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good, that's a worthy contribution then. Thank you for that, Mark. Guys, anybody who is listening, feel free to pop your questions in the start in the uh, in the chat. Jeremy, because obviously you're based in America, do you anticipate any hurdles to invest in in other parts of the world, the UK included? No, uh, you mean because of the market or just in general because of the yeah, international I, I, uh, an element? I suppose I mean the full thing, like yeah. regulatory or cultural. Yeah. yeah, so we're so we're international in our investors and investments. We have investments into... Uh, Switzerland, into Spain, into, um, uh, we're looking at a couple of German ones now. We have investments into Israel, Brazil, um, yeah, a number of other, we're looking into a couple in India. So th th there's definitely, uh, you know, economies of scale to our, the back office that we've partnered with and that we've built. Um, so we, we really don't have any trouble, you know, so long as there are, um, you know, re reasonable provisions between countries, uh, which in, you know, the vast majority of cases there are, uh, we, we have not really had any trouble investing internationally. Awesome. Okay. Guys, any budding entrepreneurs, we've got something exciting that we're going to announce tonight. I like to keep these things to about 40 minutes, short, sweet, powerful, punchy, tangible, and impactful as possible. Jeremy has partnered, his firm has partnered with Dentist Who Invest. Dentist Who Invest one of the official ambassadors for Rivera Capital, and we are effectively the UK wing for Jeremy's operation. Any budding entrepreneurs who are listening tonight, listen to this podcast, whether live or whether the recorded version, we've got something exciting for you. Dentist Who Invest, over the next few days, we're going to be announcing Dentist Who Invest Dragon's Den. That's where we want you guys to come along and pitch your companies. We want as many as possible. We want the best of the best. We're only going to let the best of the best on the live show where we, the dragons, are going to be breaking down your company, analyzing it from the bottom up, plus also giving you actionable advice to take it to the next level. So it's really going to be worthwhile for you guys, anybody out there who's got a company who is just at the start of their journey or even have, or even progressing nicely through their journey. What a valuable opportunity to have the dragons analyze your company and break it down. The best of the best from that live content, from that live video, from that live broadcast that we'll be creating on the group, which will be shot, which will be broadcast over the next few weeks. The best of the best will be able to pitch their companies to Jeremy and have the opportunity for some serious venture capital which is going to take your business to the next level. I'm flipping excited for that. I don't know about you, Jeremy. Yeah, super excited. It kind of takes me back to your analogy with the caveman. And if you went out of the cave, you'd get eaten by, a, and I wanted you to say dragon so badly. Foreshadow <laughs> uh, <laughs> the dragon's dead <laughs> announcement, but no, super excited for it. And yes, you can definitely kind of view uh, James and dentists who invest as, you know, kind of our eyes and ears on the ground and, um, in your part of the world. And, and we're so excited to, to be looking there because there's often advantages. Um, I know a lot of companies want to enter the US market and its dental market. There are other big markets around the world too. Uh, the, big, Brazil, I'd argue, is a bigger market dentally than, uh, than the US. Australia has a booming dental market. Not only that, sometimes for regulatory reasons, other markets are, are, are more viable. Sometimes it's easier in the EU or with Health Canada or um, you know, some other, uh, some other system. So, uh, look, we're very excited to, to be looking at international dental technology, or should I say denture capital? Denture capital. There we go. There we go. That's awesome. That was a, that was a quite a moment of brilliance there, Mark. I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Also, as well as that, I was going to say something else. Well, this is the thing, you know, this is the best way that I had someone, uh, maybe, maybe about a year ago, explain 
venture capital or investing in someone else's company. It's not just the money that comes into it. It's the connections and opportunities that come because of it, because they now have a vested interest in it. And it becomes effectively a social enterprise, which is really cool. And I never, I get it, I guess that it made sense, but I never had it explained in that sense to me. And I really, really enjoyed that. So I'm just going to plant that seed, leave it to simmer and grow and germinate until Jeremy and I appear on the group again next with Dental Dragons Den. Anybody who's watching it, this broadcast live tonight, you've just had a sneak peek of what we're going to do. Get formulating your ideas, if you haven't done already, for how you're going to pitch that company that you have to us or even begin to grow your company or begin your entrepreneurial journey because seriously, it's a whole flipping dimension to life that I feel that everybody should have their finger in the pie on that one. It's so much fun. And if I can say anything to encourage anybody to go down that path tonight, I will do. And I'm so looking forward to Dentists Who Invest Dragon's Den which will be announced on the group in the coming few days. Jeremy, anything that you would like to say just to round off proceedings tonight? No, thank you so much, James. Really, really appreciate the opportunity. Hope everybody enjoyed it. Looking forward to hearing from the community and those who want to invest, those who have startups. We can't wait to hear what, uh, what your interests are. Top stuff. Jeremy, thank you so much for your time tonight, my friend. We shall catch up super soon. Take care. Sure.